So without further ado, I welcome Dr. Swear. Thank you so much for your time today. And we will go ahead and get started with the presentation. Terrific. Well, thank you, Amber. And thanks to everybody who's attending this webinar. It's kind of weird not to see you, but you can see me. So I will try to look at the camera. Um, and I'm looking forward to spending the next hour with you all. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the UNL Empowerment Initiative. We support and conduct translational research designed to foster accepting communities free from bullying and other negative behaviors. Um, we don't provide in, uh, individual information on individual cases without completing a full uh, evaluation or a case analysis. Um, a, a big part of what we do is database decision making. And so doing that at the individual level, which I'll share some examples today with you all, as well as at the school uh, level. And then obviously the views expressed in this webinar are my own and don't represent um, the views of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, where, where I've worked for the past uh, 21 years. So we try to have a, a pretty decent presence on social media. And so on Facebook, the Empowerment Initiative, we have a Facebook page as well as the Bowling Research Network. And uh, we're less active on Instagram, but we're fairly active on Twitter. And so the Bowling Research Network is a network of national and international researchers. We have over 203 members. And we post three empirical research articles each week on Facebook and Twitter. So that's a nice way to keep up with some of the uh, research that's been that's being conducted in bullying prevention and intervention. And so we try to make that a useful resource uh, for our our audience and our friends. So I've been studying bullying since 1998, um, and my, I've been at the University of Nebraska, like I mentioned, for 21 years. I'm a supervising psychologist in our child and adolescent therapy clinic and have co-authored and co-edited a couple of books on bullying, prevention, and intervention, and over a decade ago developed a cognitive behavioral intervention for bully perpetrators that is, are, is implemented as a tier three intervention in the Lincoln Public Schools, which is our local public school uh, district here, as well as in our counseling and school psychology clinic. Uh, perhaps most importantly, I'm the parent of two adolescent girls uh, and have spent a lot of time uh, with them and in schools. I chaired the research advisory board for Lady Gaga's Born This Way Foundation for four years, and some of the research that I'll be talking about is research that we collected uh, with Born This Way Foundation, and a big passion of mine is part of the foundation's mission, which is to help create a kinder and braver world. And so toward the end of the webinar, I'll talk about some of those strategies and some of the things we've been doing with Born This Way Foundation. So the Empowerment Initiative at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, we conduct research on bullying and related constructs. As a licensed psychologist, I'm specifically interested in the mental health uh, correlates and sequela of involvement in bullying. And we've been working with schools across Nebraska and the U.S. since 1998 and with the goal of helping schools make database decision making decisions about bullying prevention and intervention, ideally collecting their own local data to use those data to drive important decisions about um, what to do about um, bullying within their communities and their schools. And so importantly, I think an important message for us to always keep in mind is that the value of research is its applicability. And so I wanted to share with you all two um, uh, research projects that we've been involved with in, in particular in the past six years that really kind of address this issue of applicability. Uh, the first project is helping everybody achieve respect. And there's the website on the slide. And this is a project that uh, we developed with some colleagues from uh, Harvard Graduate School of Education. And it's a project where we've trained over um, you know, thousands of National Guards mem members in the United States who deliver this presentation in high schools across the US. Over 600,000 high school students have uh, received this presentation. And we do two trainings a year with the National Guards uh, men and women across the United States. And so the idea is that high schools uh, can request this presentation from the National Guard, and the National Guard will send then uh, their trained members to deliver this presentation. And later in the webinar, I'll talk about the importance of 
using high status individuals and communities to help change the narrative and the discourse around bullying behaviors. And this uh, project has really been a passion of mine to kind of think about how do we um, get these messages out to you know, particularly rural communities that have less resources um, in the United States. And so can we reduce bullying in high schools by using National Guard uh, members to deliver the helping everyone achieve respect uh, message? And then the other project that we recently wrapped up was the Born Brave Experiences Study, which was a mixed method study. It was the first international survey in Spanish to examine mental health correlates and social support um, and bullying and victimization. And we've collected data over 10,000 youth and the goal of kind of answering the question, you know, what are supports that youth and young people need in order to build a kinder and braver world? Um, by definition, if you know, we focus on kindness and bravery, then hopefully uh, negative behaviors like bullying will be less likely um, to, to occur, that we can change the culture and the narrative around bullying behaviors. So some of my comments today will be um, based on some of this work. So in terms of the webinar objectives, I'm really interested in having you all understand the underlying cognitive mechanisms that influence bullying, and I'll talk about some of my clinical research in this area, and then to think about, you know, how we can provide strategies related to the social ecology of bullying that will ultimately reduce bullying behaviors, and then focusing on and talking about um, empathy and multiple intelligences as a way to think of, of a paradigm shift for our thinking about bullying and victimization, and then finally to talk about some kindness-based strategies uh, to help reducing bullying. And, and to keep in mind that there's really no single simple solution to stopping bullying, that bullying is a complicated social behavior um, that requires coordinated efforts to really change the uh, narrative and culture surrounding bullying behaviors, um, particularly, um, I would say, within, you know, kind of our current social climate, which, um, you know, we've seen increased levels of incivility and um, a lack of, um, you know, respectful discourse. And so I feel like we really need to collectively work together to, again, change kind of where, where we see ourselves um, in our current culture. So why is this important? I think we all know, know why focusing on bullying is important. It's a pretty ubiquitous problem with one in five uh, youth and young people reporting involvement in bullying, and it has serious consequences, uh, both for the individuals who are the targets of bullying, as well as the perpetrators of bullying, as well as bystanders. And so there's clear research on uh, mental health consequences, uh, poor academic performance, truancy, dropout, and a host of other um, psychological and psychosocial problems. So we really conceptualize bullying as a major public health concern. It's a mental health problem. It contributes to a negative school climate, lower academic functioning. And I think the challenge for adults and young people is that we don't often know how to effectively respond to bullying. And so my hope in this webinar is that by understanding some of the cognitive constructs that underlie these behaviors that we can think about ways to help youth who are involved in bullying. So I think it's important to define bullying. A uniform definition helps us monitor the incidence and magnitude of youth bullying. It helps us examine trends over time and it helps inform prevention and intervention efforts. And so as many of you um, probably know, the CDC came up with a uniform definition. Um, most researchers use some element of, or elements of the classic definition developed by Dan Olveas, and the CDC's definition uh, follows some of those guidelines. And so bullying includes three criteria. It's unwanted behavior that's purposeful and mean. It's repeated or has the potential to be repeated and it involves an imbalance of power that's either observed or, per or perceived. And so, you know, these are really the, the classic elements from uh, Dan Olveas' definition. Um, there are also four forms of bullying, uh, making threats, so verbal bullying, uh, relational bullying, physical bullying, and electronic bullying. And I think it's important to note that recent research really suggests that these forms co-occur and so, you know, thinking about these four forms and the three elements of bullying are really important as we think about assessment. 
And so bullying is different than other aggressive uh, mean behavior. And again, because of these three elements of the definition. And so we think then that it's important to think about our interventions for bullying um, as a little bit different than, say, um, interventions for, you know, one time aggressive behavior, aggressive act. Um, and so, again, these four forms of bullying typically uh, co-occur and occur in person and online and in, in the, uh, you know, social, social media. And so, you know, the four forms of bullying typically co-occur. And, um, you know, I personally think it's important not to necessarily have a separate definition for electronic bullying. I always say electronic bullying is bullying behavior. It's just taking, it's just taking place in an online medium, uh, whether it's gaming uh, systems, social media, or you know, cell phone usage. Um, so you know, part of then our uh, work with young youth and young people is to really educate them about the four forms and to talk about um, appropriate behavior in person, obviously, and as well as online behaviors. One of the things that I've written about is called Debunking the Dyadic Bias in Bullying, uh, written uh, with my colleague Dorothy Espelage. And it's really important that we understand that students' roles in bullying is not dynamic. It's not, it is dynamic. It's not a static construct. And so current longitudinal research has really demonstrated this, that kids over time move in and out of these roles. And I think this has really important implications for our interventions um, that we typically use in schools, which I'll talk about. And so there's a continuum of, on which kids uh, engage in these behaviors. And so I think that some of our interventions tend to really focus just on you know, the bully perpetrator and typically tend to be punishment-based strategies. And we know that those strategies don't work. So I think thinking uh, more deeply about some of the cognitive, underlying cognitive mechanisms help us understand how to create more um, sensitive and nuanced uh, interventions uh, for our work with students involved in the bullying victim continuum. So many people have written about the social ecological model of bullying. I'm going to talk very briefly about that because I feel like this model really informs um, our thinking about the complexity of this, these behaviors, as well as um, what interventions should be driven from our understanding of the social ecological model. So at the individual level, we know that one in five students are involved in bullying in some form over their school years. Bullying tends to increase during periods of transition, so elementary school to middle school, middle school to high school. But as kids get older, their involvement in bullying uh, tends to decrease, but involvement in other behaviors like uh, harassment or dating violence tend to increase. Um, and then we know uh, from much a lot of research that LGBTQ youth, as well as youth who are in special education, are at greater risk for being targets of bullying behaviors. And the bottom line is that you know, youth are often bullied because they're seen as different in some way from the norm within their school or their community. And so for us as educators and mental health professionals, thinking about those youth who are, quote, different um, is really important in having systems in place to help uh, youth who might be, you know, kind of, quote, outside the norm uh, is really important in terms of creating, you know, caring and nurturing environments for all youth to, to thrive. At the family level, we know that modeling of aggressive behavior is a risk factor um, for youth involvement in bullying, that punitive and unsupporting parenting styles also is a risk factor, as well as uh, physical discipline is correlated with bullying. And some research has looked at sibling aggression at home um, being associated with bullying at school. And so it stands to reason when aggression is modeled at the home that uh, these youth are more likely to be aggressive um, and engage in bullying behaviors at school. And then at the school and peer level, there's been just quite a lot of research that's been conducted on um, factors, um, you know, peer influences. Bullying is typically, you know, a behavior that is conducted within a peer group. Peers are observing. Um, and that uh, schools with high levels of bullying have been found, obviously, to have poor school climate. Um, and uh, students are going to have, there's going to be more, greater levels of bullying in schools where the climate is negative and uh, not supportive. 
And so then the opposite of that is when students feel connected and engaged at school, um, then they're less likely to be involved in bullying. And so for our work, you know, I think it's important to think about you know, how do we engage all youth uh, within the school um, building. And so that strategies like social emotional learning strategies that are effective for promoting positive pro-social behavior will also be effective uh, for preventing bullying behavior. And so I think at the school level, you know, we're thinking a lot about positive behavior intervention supports, and we're thinking about social emotional learning strategies as ways to enhance the school climate, and then by definition, uh, reduce involvement in bullying at the school level. But we all know that that's not enough, so that we also have to have targeted um, and indicated interventions for, uh, you know, maybe our more intractable youth or youth who are still engaging in you know, bullying and aggressive behaviors despite, you know, social emotional learning programs or anti-bullying programs that are conducted, you know, at the school level. And then the other thing that we can't not think about is the influence of community and our society. You know, why is it that bullying is reinforced in, you know, society or in our communities? And so, you know, there's been some really important research that's looked at the fact that bullying can be an effective strategy for young people to gain social status. Certainly not in all schools and all communities, but it can be an effective strategy. And so we need to really try to unpack and understand, you know, how is it that these behaviors are reinforced? Because if they're reinforced, then uh, young people, you know, receive the reinforcement for um, you know, bullying, bullying others. And societal messaging really matters around this. And so, you know, we've certainly seen through, you know, Twitter and other forms of social media that our national social discourse is fairly disrespectful. And so helping youth and young people to understand that, you know, it's not okay to get, engage in disrespectful discourse um, and how can how can you change? How can you not engage in that despite seeing it on television or on social media? And so related to our National Guard project, you know, what one of the things we're finding as well as other research has looked at is the importance of positive high status role models, that those role models matter. So whether they're youth role models, adult role models, um, you know, role models within the community, those role models matter and messaging from positive high status role models um, really, really makes, helps make a difference. Um, and so, you know, thinking about that in your own communities, in your own schools, who are these positive high status role models that can really help lead the charge in terms of, you know, messaging, you know, presenting anti-bullying messaging and messaging about the importance of kindness and bravery and standing up for, for um, everybody. And so related are ineffective strategies. And so, you know, the general kind of tone of let's punish the person who's doing the bullying through detention, suspension, expulsion, zero tolerance policies. We know uh, a, the American Psychological Association commissioned a task force to look at zero tolerance policies in schools and found that they were you know, mostly ineffective. And so then the challenge for all of us is, okay, so what can we do instead? And so anecdotally, um, one of our schools um, called to refer a student to our intervention program and said, you know, we don't want to suspend him, but he has to have an intervention because he's bullying, you know, some of the students in special education in, in one of our high schools here. And so I thought it was really great that, you know, the school administrators were saying, we don't want to suspend him, but we, he, needs, he needs an intervention. And so they referred him to our intervention program. And so to me, that was, a, a great sign that the school was thinking outside the box in terms of what are things we can do differently that will, you know, hopefully make a difference in this young person's life. So one of the things that I've really been, you know, working on over the years is thinking about how do we change bullying behaviors and partly as a cognitive behavioral psychologist, you know, I'm very interested in the interplay between cognitions and behavior. And so some of our research has looked at, you know, if we change cognitions, can we change behaviors? And so I'm going to share with you two studies that we've been working on um, that are, you know, in, in progress. Um, and I thought you might be interested in, in some of these data. So one of the assessment tools that we use is the How I Think questionnaire. 
And so it assesses both cognitive distortions and behavioral reference. It's published by Research Press. Um, it's a, a really, it's proven to be a really great tool for us in our work with, um, you know, bully perpetrators and bully victims and, and bystanders. We get a lot of really interesting information from this um, questionnaire. And so we've been analyzing then this data based on uh, the students who are referred for this intervention. And then we just did a simple paired samples t-test pre-post um, after, before the intervention and after the intervention. And we're in the process of writing these data up. So on this slide, you can see that all the post means um, decreased after the intervention, which, you know, we're happy that that happened. And here's a nice visual of some of the decreases. So on all of the cognitive distortions uh, subtests and the behavioral reference subtests, uh, the students who went through the intervention um, decreased um, their kind of distortions about you know, their, their behaviors. And so this gives us a really important starting point to talk with these young people and to provide recommendations for them and their adult caregivers about, okay, how can we work with this young person in an individual or small group therapy setting to identify cognitive distortions and then work to change them. So the thinking being that if you change some of the negative thinking around social interactions and relationships, then you can alter how this young person is behaving toward um, other individuals. And so kind of building off of these results that we've started seeing over the past several years, um, one of my doctoral students and myself became really interested in this idea of empathy and assessment of empathy, and then she became very interested in thinking about how multiple intelligences might impact the work that we do with youth involved in bullying. And so, you know, you can read on the slides, you know, what is empathy? It's, you know, the ability to understand others' emotional states and others' pain and distress. And there's two forms of empathy. Cognitively, it's like how do we take the perspective of somebody else's emotional state and then effectively can we respond to, you know, somebody who's in distress. And then empathy differs from sympathy, uh, which does not involve the experiencing of another person, person's emotional um, reaction. And then there's some, you know, clear research on empathy and bullying that typically children who bully others lack empathy. Um, girls tend to be higher in levels of empathy than boys. Uh, empathy tends to increase with age. So as you become more cognitively um, aware and savvy, uh, your levels of empathy tend to get higher. Um, and then the research to date on empathy and bullying has really looked at uh, primarily quantitative uh, self-report measures. And so we were interested in thinking about are there other ways to try to unearth um, this relationship between empathy and bullying. And so multiple intelligences, you all must be familiar with Har Howard Gardner's work on multiple intelligences and the different forms of in multiple intelligences. So verbal, visual, spatial, verbal, linguistic, um, logical, mathematic, bodily, kinesthetic, interpersonal, and intrapersonal. And so how individuals think about and, and have their strengths and weaknesses in different multiple intelligences, we were kind of intrigued. Would that kind of influence um, you know, their involvement in bullying and empathy um, and might be differences and kind of another way for another tool or a way for us to think about uh, these youth um, who are involved in bullying behaviors? And so students who are more linguistic um, are gonna perform better on tasks that involve uh, uh, writing, but this linguistic intelligence may not transfer to other domains. Um, students who are more visual spatial uh, might perform on different tasks, better on different tasks, or think about, you know, their relationships um, in different ways. And when they're asked to complete tasks that maybe aren't in their dominant, you know, multiple intelligence, um, maybe they don't have the opportunity to apply their strengths, so maybe they, you know, might feel more frustrated. Um, so we were interested in kind of applying this uh, to the study of bullying behaviors with the goal of giving us in schools another tool to think about um, working with these youth and young people. And so this was a mixed methods study um, where we looked at uh, students who had been referred to the intervention program. And you can see that 
you know, we had a pretty decent gender split in terms of male, female. Uh, their ages range from 7 to 15. This is intervention um, we've conducted with uh, youth ages 7 to 19. Um, and the majority of the participants uh, had displayed a dominance in bodily kinesthetic intelligence, followed by musical, visual, spatial, interpersonal, math, logic, and verbal linguistics, other linguistic. And so the idea was do these different intelligences uh, inform our understanding of empathy um, and, and the role that empathy might play in bullying uh, perpetration. And remember, all of these youth who are referred to the intervention are referred for bullying behaviors. And so they, they either identify as a bully perpetrator, bully victim, bystander, all three. Again, this idea that youth it, uh, engage in multiple roles in um, their bullying involvement over time. So just very briefly, um, we use the bully survey uh, to uh, assess some, for some demographic variables as well as their bullying behaviors. Uh, this is a self-report measure, which has its obvious limitations. Um, the interpersonal reactivity index is, is a quantitative measure of empathy. And so we've been using that for a number of years and a number of other researchers use the same measure. Then we developed a draw bullying situation. And so some of you might be familiar with the, um, the program Bully Busters, which was co-developed by Andy Horn at the University of Georgia. And in that, in that program, they use a tool called Draw Bully, although we changed it to say Draw Bullying Situation, which is a little a mouthful, but we try not to use the words bully and victim as nouns, which imply that the behavior can't be changed. We try to say bullying or being victimized uh, to communicate that these are behaviors that can be changed. Um, so we developed this draw bullying situation that's been part of the intervention um, you know, for a number of years. The idea was, can we get at empathy through a different modality, particularly if young people have different strengths in terms of multiple intelligences. So for you know, young people, not, not all self-report measures are gonna be a great way of capturing um, some of these uh, differences and nuances in a complicated social behavior like bullying. And then we use the MI3 talent key, which is a online measure of multiple intelligences. So you know, the kids sit at a computer, they see different um, pictures and, and they're asked different questions and then based on how they answer the different questions, that categorizes them into their dominant um, intelligence types. And so just briefly, some key findings. Um, bullies reported on the quantitative assessment, so the interpersonal reactivity index, bullies reported less empathy, I should say bully perpetrators, uh, reported less empathy. Uh, females endorsed greater empathy, in, uh, totally consistent with the research on gender and empathy. And then there were no age differences. And on the qualitative assessment, you know, we didn't find the same gender differences in the drawings. Um, and then we found that participants with dominant interpersonal intelligence were more likely to understand the intent of the, you know, the bullying situation. Um, bullying, bully victims, so students who both perpetrate bullying and are victimized, um, displayed effective empathy toward the victim in their drawings. Um, and then participants with low empathy scores on the quantitative measure drew high empathy in their drawings. And so we thought, you know, the, the uh, discordance between the quantitative assessment and the qualitative assessment was really interesting and felt that these drawings really were capturing a uh, different, maybe nuanced understanding of the complexity of, what, of bullying situations. And so we really think, as we think about assessment, that you know, multiple forms of, of assessment, so beyond you know, just you know, self-report paper and pencil answering questions, is really important. And so whether it's including observational data or including you know, more projective data like drawings, uh, particularly for younger uh, kids who maybe are kind of pre-verbal or not as verbal, or for individuals who are not high on, uh, you know, linguistic uh, intelligence, that having some other ways of assessing um, some of their social concerns like bullying um, are really important. And then also kind of taking into account that 
students' strengths in different areas um, than are related to their understanding of you know, bullying situations and then playing on their strengths, how can we help these students think differently about you know, their social interactions? So I'm gonna move on to then talking about how I think these cognitive, underlying cognitive mechanisms um, like cognitive distortions, like empathy, uh, like multiple intelligences, really can set the foundation for us thinking about bullying in a different way and really um, what I'm kind of calling a paradigm shift, that I think it's really critical that we have a paradigm shift in this country and other countries in terms of how we respond to uh, youth who are involved in bullying. And so I'm gonna talk a bit about this paradigm shift, uh, then talk about um, some kindness strategies that we've used and we use in our bank of recommendations uh, when we write reports for schools, and then open it up to some question and answer time. So, you know, this is stating the obvious, but bullying prevention starts with everybody making a commitment to treating everybody with dignity, respect, acceptance. How do we create nurturing environments, you know, for all children and young people? Um, and that's that's just a basic foundation. And so um, I think thinking through how we really operationalize this is important. And so how do we create, so some of the work that we've done with Born This Way Foundation is how do we create kinder and braver world, or kinder, kinder and braver schools, you know, communities and homes. And this takes intention. And some of the work that we did with the foundation, uh, what we heard from our participants was the importance of engage, the ability to engage. And so obviously having, you know, lots of areas where students can engage in school. So not just athletics, you know, not just music. Um, so in our community, 4-H is a huge um, opportunity for young people to get involved in lots of different activities. So, you know, how do we as mental health professionals and uh, school professionals think about what are the opportunities that my school or my community is providing for the young people uh, to, to become actively engaged? Because we know if youth and young people are engaged, then they're less likely um, to, you know, engage in some neg negative, you know, delinquent behaviors. Another huge thing for us, and, I, and I'm assuming most people on this webinar resonate with this, is the importance of access to mental health services and how we as mental health professionals and school professionals really must advocate for um, our students and families having access to mental health services. I would say, at least in my work, that's one of the number one barriers that people talk about. They don't know either where to go, um, they don't have the resources, uh, so how do we uh, kind of think creatively as communities in terms of how we provide uh, mental health services in schools? Um, so you know, most schools have counseling centers. How do we use those counseling centers in productive ways to provide mental health support uh, to students? And certainly this is something that we're seeing across the country, that access to uh, mental health services is critical. We're seeing this on college campuses across the United States that students' mental health needs are not being met. And so if bullying is a mental health problem, um, one of the solutions then is increased access to mental health services so we can address um, these issues. So there's some really great books that some of you might be familiar with, workbooks um, at workbookpublishing.com that are focused on school-based cognitive behavioral therapy that have a robust research background um, so, and they're, and they're also inexpensive. And so I think that's a great resource um, for the mental health professionals on this call if you're not familiar with those workbooks. And then again, thinking about how do we explicitly teach, you know, kindness and bravery? How do, we t how do we instill hope in our young people who are feeling hopeless? How do we help people use difficult experiences to create positive change? And so that was one of, you know, I think an important lesson from a lot of, um, you know, high status role models, whether they're celebrities or people in the community who have experienced, you know, trauma or tragedy and then use those experiences to create positive, you know, change in their communities. And so I think for us supporting individuals, uh, telling their stories, 
um, sharing these difficult experiences. So our youth and young people think, I'm not alone. There are other people who have experienced, um, you know, difficult times and they have risen above or they have improved uh, their lives. And again, you know, kind of back to this idea of how do we provide multiple opportunities for engagement? Because when when students are disengaged, that's when we worry that they, you know, are disengaged. They're feeling marginalized. Um, and then that leads into a host of other problems, whether it's mental health problems, behavioral problems, aggression, bullying, things like that. And so, you know, as a community, as a school community, you know, we want to think about how do we provide opportunities uh, for students to feel, uh, feel engaged and be engaged. So there's some online resources that uh, many of you are probably familiar with. So Random Acts of Kindness has a free curriculum for teachers. Um, they cover lots of different grade levels. Um, there's downloadable posters, things like that. So I always talk to teachers about um, this resource. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with the resources on castle.org, so the Collaborative for Social and Emotional Learning. Uh, they have a book of uh, research-based programs in social and emotional learning that uh, cover elementary school, middle school, and high school. And they're a great resource, as well as a great advocacy group for promoting social emotional learning um, in our schools and at the federal level. Um, so they're, they're great if you're not familiar with them. Uh, Facebook has teamed up with the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence to create a, um, a series of activities called Inspire Ed. And so your school could be apply to be an Inspire Ed school, and they have a dedicated group for Inspire Ed educators, Inspire Ed students, and they showcase um, examples of schools across the United States that are creating, um, you know, anti-bullying initiatives, um, you know, kinder and, and braver kind of school projects, and really highlighting those. And so there's a lot of great ideas. And there are different activities that teachers can incorporate in their classroom that range from you know, five minutes long to 15 minutes long that were developed by experts that focus on social emotional learning skills, emotional regulation. So, you know, the things that we want to see in terms of how do we increase empathy? You know, how do we help uh, all students feel engaged and involved? Uh, the Greater Good Science Center at Berkeley, uh, University of California, Berkeley, has uh, a, a weekly newsletter that they send out. They have great articles on the science of kindness and, um, you know, happiness, and they have webinars. So they're also a great resource if you're not familiar with them. And then Born This Way Foundation um, has a, a Get Help Now page, which uh, is very comprehensive. And so that is a resource that I often give out to uh, young people um, who are uh, needing or wanting additional uh, kind of mental health resources, as well as they have, uh, they're currently running a initiative called 21, Day, uh, 21 Days of Kindness. And so youth and young people and adults uh, can sign up to take the 21 day challenge and um, document and uh, you know, tweet about uh, different kind acts uh, that they're doing in the month of September. And so, you know, really the focus of Born This Way Foundation is, you know, how do we help inspire youth and young people and adults to create a kinder and braver world? And so they have some specific activities that they do around those themes that are, you know, free and easily transportable uh, to your school communities. And this is a poster that I just think, you know, is just a simple, kind and brave test that if everybody asks themselves these questions, then, you know, we we probably would have a kinder and braver world. So, you know, how do we help young people, you know, and and adults to internalize, OK, what am, are my words kind? You know, are my words true? Are they useful? You know, how am I behaving? Is it kind? Is it helpful? Um, and really kind of back to thinking about, you know, how do we help if you think back to that slide, the predominant multiple intelligence, um, uh, 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 the predominant multiple intelligence for our participants who are bully perpetrators was bodily kinesthetic. 
which makes sense. You know, these kids often are dysregulated uh, who are engaged in bullying behaviors, are dysregulated, are impulsive. And so how do we help them think through, are my actions, you know, kind and helpful? Um, so I think this is, you know, an easy poster that a teacher could make and hang up in their, in their classrooms and have the kids think about these questions. There's also lots of apps, and so the Random Acts of Kindness has a kindness app, and so this is something that could easily be, you know, it's A, free, but then could be done, you know, in the classroom where you might have kids do, you know, kindness competitions or, you know, have them document, you know, what are kind acts that they did, you know, on a daily basis or have them engage in this 21 acts of kindness. Uh, the Greater Good Science Center also puts out a calendar for every month and it's called a, a kindness calendar and you know you could hang that up in the classroom and think about okay what are kind acts that we're doing today and how do we document and we talk about it and so I think the more we talk you know clearly with students about our expectations for kindness um, that maybe then the the opposite will happen and we will have less you know mean and bullying behaviors and this is a quote that I just really like to, you know, end with, um, which this was a, a teacher who was at Sandy Hook, and um, she was uh, one of Glamour Magazine's Women's, Women of the Year a number of years ago, and she says, when you teach kindness, love, and empathy, there's no room for hate. And I think that's just a nice, um, you know, kind of motto for us to kind of think about, and that we actively need to teach kindness, um, love, and respect, and empathy. And that that's part of our job as educators, mental health professionals, teachers, um, and that really should be kind of our mantra, uh, working with youth and young people. So I'll make a, a pitch for uh, the World Anti-Bullying Forum in Dublin, uh, June 4th through 6th. So this series of webinars um, is designed to have some of the presenters uh, in Dublin uh, provide some webinars for you all and kind of get the buzz um, up about about the World Anti-Bullying Forum. So I encourage you uh, to think about joining us in Dublin. And then this is my contact information. Uh, feel free to check out our website. Um, if you have questions, you can ask them in this webinar, but also you can send me an email and follow us on Facebook um, and Twitter. So I thank you all for your, um, your listening and attendance. I'm happy to report that I, I followed the directions and I'm on time with my 45 minutes, which uh, was designed to allow 15 minutes for question and answer. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Sir, for all of that information. I do have a few questions here. Okay. Um, let me just kind of go through some of these. So. I used to do group therapy and put stickers on the door at times would just do a group to show random acts of kindness. Each person demonstrates how to show kindness to their peers. So it sounds like that was um, an example of one way how they do um, the acts of kindness, which is great. Oh, I Here's think another a, question. Yeah, that's a great idea. Okay. Yeah. Um, so this is hi from Romania. Uh, what individual diff? Yeah. <laughs> What individual differences were found in applying I, IRI on differently cohorts? We are seeing huge differences when it comes to kids from placement centers and kids coming from value high status role models. We had surprises like huge IRIs with combined bullying, early sexual abuse on high status models as opposed to bullying der deriving from poverty. Oh, that's, um, that's kind of a long question. So, yeah. 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 So I think certainly, you know, empathy is going to vary widely based on, you know, you, you know, young people's experiences. And it sounds like you have quite a range of young people coming from, you know, pretty trauma oriented backgrounds um, to, you know, kind of maybe less trauma, um, you know, in their background. And certainly in our public schools, we've got a range of you know, trauma experiences, um, but probably not the range that, that you're seeing. And so um, I think it's really important as we think about our work with traumatized youth um, that we think about, you know, assessing their strengths um, and weaknesses and then also thinking about, you know, how do we promote 
and develop empathy, particularly among youth, you know, who have been uh, traumatized. And on a clinical level, I used to work in residential treatment and saw just a lot of variability that I think you're seeing with uh, youth <laughs> who have different kind of, uh, you know, traumatic um, experiences in their background. And then part of our work with with them is to you know, find strategies for developing um, empathy. And there's a really interesting program in Canada called Roots of Empathy. And they've applied some of those, uh, or they've applied that program or use that program uh, with youth who are prone to, um, you know, uh, bully, you know, other, bully their peers and have found some preliminary really positive results with that. Thank you. Another question, um, any research or resources specific to inclusion in students with disabilities? So I think the PACER, um, www.pacer.org. So they're a group in Minnesota that uh, has lots of resources um, about bullying and uh, youth with disabilities. And they have a report that they put out. I want to say it's annually. It's called Walk a Mile in Their Shoes. And there's a lot of great uh, information like statistics and research on um, bullying and, and youth with disabilities and then inclusion. And so I would direct, uh, I would direct you to their website um, and, and see all the information that they have. The Council for Exceptional Children in the United States also does, um, you know, publishes research on bullying and uh, students with disabilities and inclusion. And I would say probably the leading researcher in this country in this area is Chad Rose, who's at the University of Missouri. Thank you. Um, another one says, I understand the idea of high status role models, but I have been discouraging my schools from one time presentations slash assemblies in favor of ongoing work. Do one time assemblies show evidence of impact or are they just for culture of other work? Um, in other words, in what context would you recommend a program like here? Yeah, I think that's a great question. So, yeah, in general, we know that one-time assemblies are, aren't effective on their own. I think when you think about using a one-time presentation or assembly in conjunction with the other work, ongoing work that you're doing in the school, it can be an important kind of kickoff. But in terms of do we have an expectation that a one-time assembly is going to change behavior? I think the answer, I think we know the answer is no, but in conjunction with ongoing work, can it get the dialogue started? And so I think it really depends on where, you know, the school is and the work that the school is already doing. So for a lot of our here schools, they're in very rural areas in the United States that have extremely limited access to resources. And so, you know, the advantage then is that they can get a resource in, and often in these rural communities, the National Guards, men and women, are um, seen as pillars of the community, and kids listen to what they have to say. And so we've found that um, that seems to be an effective starting point, but it's certainly not the, it certainly should never be the only thing a school does. Thank you. Um, there's also a number of questions on here whether or not your PowerPoint um, would be able to be shared. Um, I will quick mention to everybody on the webinar that this is being recorded um, and we will be able to, uh, the World Anti-Bullying Forum will be posting the webinar on their website um, shortly after this webinar. So you'll be able to access it again. Um, but I'll let you, Dr. Swear, decide whether or not you want that also sent out everyone that's part that participated today yeah so however you guys do it I mean if you want to send it out I mean I can send it to you and if you want to email it out to the participants that's great if they just want to go to the world anti-bullying forum website and download it um, that's terrific too okay great um, so I'll follow up with you on that okay. um, another question this says hi from Buenos Aires Argentina Ooh. How, yeah, how do you suggest we try to get parents on board with the more inclusive view of teaching kindness and bravery? So, yeah, that's, I mean, that's an interesting question. I mean, it's like, how do we, 
and you know how do we get parents to go to parent teacher conferences um so i think you know part of it is just thinking about how schools are communicating and messaging with their parents and so the importance of ongoing parent school communication i think is critical and so then having consistent messaging to parents or maybe having a newsletter or you know some some communication that goes home to parents with strategies for you know how can you develop kindness in the home uh, how can you you know teach the values of kindness and bravery to your children and so really working um, you know, working hard to set up uh, consistent communication with homes and schools. One of the things we've been doing in this community, as well as, you know, across other communities across the United States, is using pediatricians. So in our community, all kids have mandatory times that they have to go to the pediatrician's office. And so we've been working with pediatricians to get information, whether it's like in pamphlet form, or a little newsletter uh, with things that parents can do to you know, promote kindness and bravery in their homes. Um, so I think thinking about where are points where kids and parents really have to go. And so pediatricians um, have really been an important resource for us. And so I think thinking outside the box a little bit in terms of you know, how, how do we communicate with parents and who in the community is consistently communicating with parents. And so physicians for us have been an important tool. Okay, thank you. Um, it does look like that is it for all of the questions for today. Um, so again, just as a follow-up, um, you will receive a follow-up email thanking you for your attendance that will come in your email tomorrow um, that will include a link to register for the World Anti-Bullying Forum. Um, which is June 4th through 6th in Dublin, Ireland. Um, so you can uh, go to that um, link to find out more information and also to register if you're interested. Um, and then secondly, just as a reminder, the webinar will also be on the World Anti-Bullying Forums um, website, the recording of today's webinar. Um, and if uh, you need, uh, we will also forward on um, Dr. Swear's uh, PowerPoint to everyone who is in attendance today. So thank you so much, um, Dr. Swear, for your time today, and thank you for this important information shared with everybody online today. And um, it looks like there's no other questions, so I will go ahead and um, end this webinar, um, unless you have a few other thoughts you wanted to add before we go. No, thank you all so much for participating. I love the fact that we had attendees from around the world, and I think the World Anti-Bullying Forum in Dublin is gonna be a really, really terrific uh, conference, and I know we're all really looking forward to it.